I'm guessing you clicked on this video because you're doing your research before buying your next table saw and you're looking into getting one with a cast iron top. Just so you know right up front, I'm not going to try to talk you into buying this model. In fact, this rigid table saw is no longer sold in stores. My goal for this video is to give you an overview of this saw and tell you about my experiences using it in the last six and a half years. I'm going to tell you what I like about it and what I don't like about it, and believe me, it has issues, but we'll get to that. Welcome to my wood shop. If you're new here, my name's Brett. Even if you're not new here, my name's still Brett. This is the Rigid Hybrid Table Saw, also known as a contractor saw. It's model number R4512. And like I said, this model is no longer sold at Home Depot, which is where I bought this in 2016. Rigid has since come out with two new iterations since this saw, uh, and their current model number is R4560, that's 60. This saw uh, represents the beginning of my woodworking journey. This is the first table tool that I bought when I decided to get into woodworking in 2016. And obviously it's still working because it's still in my shop. Okay, let's get to the show and tell. We'll start with the cast iron top. I'm going to get a straight edge. You don't really need to shine a light under it to tell that the table is not quite flat. So, you know, it's not perfect, but for what I do, I haven't run into any areas where the lack of flatness has affected my woodworking where things don't fit. So far that hasn't been an issue. The cast iron portion of this measures about 20 inches, maybe 20 and a quarter from left to right and 26 and a half inches from the front of the table to the front of the saw blade all the way raised up we're at 11 and a half inches and off of the back of the saw it's about six inches not counting the riving knife the wings are stamped steel and um, that introduces some issues the the edges it can be kind of rounded the difference in material too makes it difficult to line up and get level and straight when assembling you may not be able to get it exactly there. It'd be really nice if they would provide cast iron wings as well. I think the model before this one might have had cast iron wings, or maybe that was an add-on. Uh, I'm not sure. Some people replace these wings with either plywood or melamine or MDF, something like that. Assembly for this saw is fairly extensive. Thankfully, the instructions are really good, and the parts bags for the hardware are well marked. As I recall, this was a while ago that I put this together. It has T-channel miter slots on either side of the blade. These two are not milled perfectly. This is the one that I use the most with my miter gauge and uh, it seems to bind up in the in the front and the back. So I, th I think it's bowed just, just slightly. So again, not perfect, but pretty good. This has a 30 inch rip capacity on the right and a 15 inch capacity on the left. This is an aftermarket zero clearance plate that um, I bought from, I think, Leecraft makes these? Yeah, Leecraft. This is the throat plate that comes with the saw. It's eighth inch steel. Kind of makes it difficult to make your own zero clearance plate just because there's not a lot of depth here because we've got these little tabs with Phillips head screws in them for leveling. So the, the stock throat plate has these little holes to access those Phillips screws to get the throat plate level. It's also wide enough to allow for beveling, but then obviously it's not zero clearance. And this just has a, a tab on the back and a finger hole on the front. The aftermarket does not have a tab on the back. It just sets in there, but it has these recesses for the, the leveling tabs. Before I bought this, I actually made my own zero clearance plate. This one ended up being for dados. This is made out of PVC. I've got some, some other blanks here that I haven't used yet. I don't know if you know this, but you can flatten out a PVC tube in the oven. You just cut it to the length that you need it and then make one cut down one edge of the tube. And then as you heat it slowly in the oven, you can flatten it out. So that's what these are made out of. And this one has a tab on the back and then I put a washer on the front because there's a magnet up here to help hold it down. So this is the one I use for dados. I do have another aftermarket throat plate that I got from Leecraft for dados, but I forgot I even had this until I started making this video. Here on the front of the saw, 
We've got the power switch over here with a nice big red paddle that I mostly use my leg to shut that off. Then you have to lift it up to turn it on. Um, it is plugged in right now, so I'm not going to actually flip this, but there's a safety key here that comes out in case you got kids or uh, employees or something. I don't know. Um, I think on the newer models, there's an actual padlock hole that you can put a padlock in there. This bundle does not have that, but it does have the safety key. We got onboard storage for the fence. I don't usually keep my fence over here just because I have an outfeed table on the back. I'll show you that in a bit. So it doesn't fit all the way and it's kind of tippy. So I actually kind of keep it either on the saw or on top of the trash can which, which sits over on this side of the saw. This is the wheel that raises and lowers the blade. Right, right to raise, left to lower. See what I did there? Yeah, it's a little squeaky. Probably needs some lube. And then we got the scale here for the bevel tilt all the way up to 45 degrees. The bevel handle is over here but I'll change camera angle so you can see that a little better. This um, raise and lower wheel is the one of the things that's given me the most trouble on this saw but I'll come back to that. Over on the right hand side of the saw we've got the bevel wheel that'll take it from a little past zero to a little past 45 degrees with a locking knob in the center here. We've got onboard storage for the miter gauge that does come with the saw. It also came with a basic push stick with a magnet on it so it'll Still there, kind of. It slides, but whatever. This isn't where I usually keep it, but um, it's there for today's video. And there's another knob that it's meant for storing blades, but I keep blades in a different spot. That wouldn't be very handy for me, but you have that option. And then this is, this is my rescue stick. I have a magnet on the end of a stick, just in case I drop the arbor nut inside the saw and it'll fall down. There's a, a plastic funnel at the bottom of this underneath here. The dust collection hose is attached to that funnel. So if the nut fell inside the saw, it would fall into the beginning of the dust collection hose. And uh, as long as dust collection isn't running, I can still retrieve it with this magnet stick. So that lives right there. The saw blade is raised all the way up. This is the riving knife locking lever. It's in the locked position right now. It's it's really tight. I can't really lift it out just with my hand, so I always have to use a channel lock to grab it. But then when, once it's up, that allows you to take the riving knife to one higher position or all the way out. I usually take it out to change blades. The saw comes with these wrenches to change blades. This one goes on this side of the arbor. There's a flat spot in it. And just find that and then this slips over the nut and I'm always very leery not to lose this nut down in, in there so I always put a finger on it and then spin it off it's a two-handed process same with the washer And the blade comes out like that. And this will fit a full dado stack up to 13 16 inches or an 8 inch dado stack 10 inch blade. This is not the stock blade that comes with. This is a CMT combination blade which is what I use for most cutting unless I'm doing a lot of ripping. I don't think I've ever used the blade that came with this. Maybe when I first got it. That's how you change a blade. I always put the riving knife back in. And then again, I can't get it down without a tool pushing on it. That's tight. I'll be honest, I never use the blade guard and that's because I very often switch back and forth between using this as a saw and a work surface. So when I'm doing assembly or glue up, this is the surface that I'm working on. I just put a piece of OSB over the top of it with the blade all the way down. Because I'm going back and forth, I, I don't leave the blade guard on. But I will show you how the blade guard goes on. So the riving knife has to be in its top position 
Again, there's two positions. I usually keep this in the lower position because I'm not, again, I'm not putting the blade guard on. But here it is. It's a split blade, plastic blade guard with metal hardware. And there's this bar in the back here that fits into this middle slot. So you just find that. And then there's this lever here. I don't know how well you can see that. There's a lever in the center and that locks it down. So now it's locked on. But then these are free to move and they're in constant contact with the tabletop regardless of the height of the blade. And then the riving knife also has a spot for the anti-kickback pawls. This is a spring-loaded button here. So you have to depress that and then slide it over that little notch and then it locks in with, with this thing. So, so now that's locked in and to remove it you would just push that button again and it slides right off. These also, oops, you have to depress it to put it on. There, it's locked in. And these work independently of each other. And these also work independently of each other. And while I have these on, I'll show you what it looks like when you bevel with the blade guard on. Now I gotta make sure my blade's back at 90. Very handy to have one of these digital angle finders for quickly getting your blade where it needs to be. Lock that in. Before we get into the two biggest trouble areas with this, uh, at least for me, there's a couple of new developments with my channel that I want to talk to you about. If you're just a casual passerby and you only want to know about the saw, you can skip this part. But if you've been following my channel for a while, there's a couple of new things that I want to tell you about. This is the first video that I've made since I've added these new things, so I'm excited to talk about them. The first is that I've added YouTube channel memberships. That's where you can become a member of my channel and support me as a creator. I'm offering some cool perks along with that at the different levels. I won't take a bunch of time to go over the details, but if you're interested or just curious, you can click on the join button right next to the subscribe button below this video. The second is that I now have a website for my business. I've had the domain name brettsbasementwoodshop.com for a long while, but I never had a website to attach it to, but now I do. So there you can see some of the work that I've done. There's a contact form if you want me to do some custom work for you. I'll also be selling plans there, some for sale, some for free. So check that out if you're interested, brettsbasementwoodshop.com. Okay, back to the saw. The fence is mostly aluminum, some plastic, and it's got two points of contact here, well three really, but it's got this little grabber on the back rail, and then these two plastic parts make contact with the inside front of the rail here. So when you lock it down with the lever here, it travels here and squeezes on the back side. So it's really just pinching between the front and the back rail, which can introduce some issues. Yeah. There's a high spot here that I'm hitting when I slide it over. It slides pretty well, but what can happen is when you lock it down, I don't know if you can see this on camera, but if you put a square on it, right here, do you see that? There's a, a pretty big gap here. I have it locked in, but it's not square. So it's not gonna automatically square itself when you lock it down. So because of that, you may have to measure the front and the back of the blade against the fence to make sure that they're equal distance. Otherwise you might be pinching your workpiece and that can become a kickback issue and that's dangerous. So that's a big drawback of this fence is you can't really rely on it locking down square. It, it does lock well, it's not going to move once it's locked, but the fact that it's pinching both the front and the back rail is not the best fence system. Another feature of this fence is it's got T-track on the top. There's two grooves here on the top and one on each side for putting jigs and clamps and things like that. You can use a quarter 20 bolt for hardware or a toilet bowl bolt would also work. If I'm not mistaken, I do think that they've made improvements to the newer fence, how it locks on. 
but I don't have those details so you'll have to check that out for yourself but on this older model this is what we've got the fence itself is flat I haven't had any issues there it also has these clear view windows to see the rule on the fence but um, I only use those for approximation they are adjustable so you can get it dialed in but uh, actually one of the holes that holds mine in does, doesn't hold very well um, there's a bit of slop in mine for some reason so I don't rely on the measurement off of the rail I take my measurements from the blade to the fence. One of the other modifications I did is right away when I got the saw I converted it from 120 to 240 and put a new plug on the end of it. The instructions in the manual made it super simple to make that change over. I'm not sure if you can do that on the current model. You'll have to look and see. I, I really don't know the answer. But what it does is allows it to power up more quickly and um, it runs on lower amps and uh, it, it's been great. And I mentioned that I was having trouble with the blade raising wheel. I don't know if that's the name for it, but <laughs> that's what it is. Um, and I, I really hesitate taking this apart to show you because it's actually been working for a good while, several months, where I haven't had to monkey with it. But over the years, numerous times I've had to fix this. This is a newer wheel. This is not the original wheel that the saw came with. I did have to buy a replacement because I'll show you that this is the lock knob and then there's a washer there's this slot here and kind of a double cylinder and the inside cylinder broke and this one's broken too but it's still working and then this slot slides over a retaining pin that holds the spring back in place and there's a hole in this rod which you know actuates the the raising and lowering mechanism inside there's a sleeve over it and then a spring and then a little pin that holds the spring back and also this wheel turns against that small pin and it's this pin that has sheared off many many times I don't even remember what the original pin looked like but what I've been replacing it with is just uh, a finish nail because that that's what fits in the hole and these finish nails keep busting yeah I'm not gonna take that out because like I said this has been working but I did want to show you that I'll give you a, a little closer up image so yeah there's this sleeve over I'm not even sure what that does I think it's just a spacer of some sort and then the spring inside of it and this hole for this pin goes all the way through this rod and right now it's only it's only poking out half of it uh, so yeah I guess I can slide that up a little bit and then and then this part fits over that and I need a washer and the lock knob This has been super frustrating over the years because every time that little finish nail breaks I can't raise and lower the blade anymore so it has to be addressed in the moment. It's been a real pain in the ass. Noble Steve. Let me know in the comments if you have the saw and if that thing has happened to you because I don't know if this is just a fluke on my machine or if it's a common thing among rigid users. I don't know. I haven't seen anybody else struggle with that so but Maybe no one wants to talk about it. One great feature about this saw is its mobility. It's got an integrated wheel system that it engages with this foot lever. It's a little hard to get to on mine just because of this counter. But then once you got it up, then you can just roll it around to wherever you need it. Mine's a little trickier with this outfeed table on. It kind of makes it heavy on that side. This is where it usually lives. And then there's there's really no gentle way to lower it down. It kind of ka-chonks. This is my outfeed table. It's attached to the cabinet of the saw. 
I got this idea from Colin Kinnett at Woodwork Web. He goes in great detail how to attach one of these to your saw, and he has this same rigid table saw. So I'll leave a link to that video in the description as well. It works on two ratcheting shelf brackets, and mine have lost the ability to ratchet anymore for some reason. It's not super stable, so I don't do any work on it. It's strictly for outfeed. Each of the brackets needs to be released, and that used to be a two-handed job, but I made this assembly here so that I could push on both of them at once with a trigger. So I could lower it down with one hand. This is in need of replacement. You can probably tell this is a pretty small shop. It's only about 200 square feet. So space is a premium and everything needs to be mobile. I am making plans to build an outfeed table that'll also function as an assembly table, a workbench, and it'll have dust collection on the inside of it. So that'll be a space saver too. So you can look forward to that project. I hope I get to that this year, we'll see. Um, it'll depend on the custom work that I have to do. Um, but if I ever get some shop time to just make stuff for the shop, that's definitely up there on my priority list. I should probably talk about the rigid lifetime service agreement. And as it sounds, it's a agreement for service. So it's not exactly a warranty. What rigid wants is for you to send in your tool or bring it to a local service center for repairs. Now, can you imagine sending or bringing a table saw anywhere once it's put together? Me neither. So yeah, it's lifetime, but how are you gonna use it? Matt Outlaw did a video about his experience with the Rigid LSA on his channel, 731 Woodworks. I'll leave a link to that in the description below this video. And I probably should have talked about this at the beginning of the video, but I forgot, so here we are. As far as I know, there are only two contractor or hybrid style table saws on the market that are under the $1,000 price point, and that's the Rigid and the Delta. As I mentioned before, Home Depot sells the Rigid, and Lowe's sells the Deltas. So I'll put links in the description for those as well so you can check out the specs. They're both pretty close in price point, but they do have some different features. And though I don't have any experience with it, from what I've seen, the Delta rip fence seems to be a better design. If you got value out of this video, go ahead and give it a like, and good luck and Godspeed on your table saw search. I'm guessing you're clicked on, I'm guessing you're. There's gonna be a lot of outtakes in this one. And then it seems to be square. <clears throat> or not. I have to get off my knee now.